Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here, live from the Wild Wind Workshop, um, <laughs> Wild Wind Sailing Holidays here in sunny Greece, where I have to tell you, the weather has still been absolutely off the chain. Yes, wall to wall sunshine every single day of the last two weeks. Very nice. Not so much in the wind department, but either way, very nice indeed. So nice, in fact, that I've lined up something quite special for tomorrow morning where I'm going to be going out taping something that I haven't done before. So keep your eye out for that one. Yes, this is the live Q&A. And yes, I have um, taken the plunge and upgraded my internet. So this should be lasting the distance today. So uh, fingers crossed for that. Um, today's live Q&A is coming in association with Wild Wind Mauritius. Which is possibly one of the coolest places you can go sailing on the planet. Uh, Wild Wind Mauritius has got two different styles of sailing. One inside the lagoon for your fun blasting. Two outside the lagoon for some big rolling swells and some of the best adventure sailing you can do on the planet. So if you are thinking of going on a nice holiday this winter or summer, I suppose, depending on where you are, then uh, check out Wild Wind Mauritius. I'll put a link in the description later on. All right, just going to check in with everybody who's checking in. We've got Brim, who says, hi, great to have you on board. Uh, Toots on board from Texas. Great to have you with us, Toot. Hopefully this week we will go the distance live. We've got Leland Lee from Florida. Hello, Leland Lee. Great to have you with us. Uh, Office Hands Dave is on board. Hey, Joe, you rock and roll. Hello to Scott, the American, and Sevy the Swede. Oh, yes. Um, we're gathering a kind of Joyrider TV community who visit Wild Wind in September. Oh, Office Hands Dave being one of the key members of that group. Great to have you with us. Kurosh is on board in sunny Dubai. Home of the next sale GP. All right. Nice. Yeah, looking forward to that one. Hope you're doing well there, Kurosh. Toots on board with the first question of the day. Um, Toot has already been on board. He was back in uh, number two there in the live chat. But um, Toot says, what about putting a spinnaker on a NACRA 5.7? Well, I would say that seems to be quite a good idea. Um, the NACRA 5.7, I am guessing, I'm just a uh, NACRA 5.7 specs. All right, I'm just checking out the specs here as we go. Um, so the 5.7 is, I'm just looking for the width. All right, still looking for the width. Stay with me, guys because the width is what can be one of the biggest contributing factors to how big the spinnaker should be. It's two metres 44 wide. So that is the same width as a Hobie 16, which would mean if you were to put a F-18, because it's just a smidge, that means small distance, shorter than an F-18. So you could, in theory, put a whole spinnaker kit from an F-18 on that bad boy. Um, but with the boat being a little bit narrower would mean you will be really um, heated up when you're hoisting that bad boy in anything over, I'd say, about eight knots of breeze. So probably the ideal would be if you um, shared the geometry with the spinnaker from something like an FX-1 which I know in the US there are not an abundance of, but um, on Joyrider TV, you'll have seen plenty of FX1 sailing. So I would say that would be about the right size of spinnaker, spinnaker pole and everything else as for the NACRA 5.7. But it certainly is going to liven things up on the downwind points of sale. Um, 
especially if you're looking at some adventure sailing, doing some distance, or if you're going out in light winds and just want it a bit livelier when you're going downwind, I think that will be a lot of fun. Great idea there, Toot. Looking forward to seeing the results of that one. All right, we've got Benedetto. Who says, hello, master. <laughs> Too kind. Um, I just bought a Mastrum full carbon tube for my Tornado. Now I need to install it. Any suggestions? Yeah. Um, now, it depends on the vintage of that Mastrum tube. But I believe the tube that I've got on my Tornado is also a Mastrum one, one of the original ones with a roller. So um, if this is the opening of the chute, it kind of looks a bit like that. Uh, so this would be the front where the pole sticks out. And then at the back of the opening here, there is ac that is actually a carbon fiber roller which works very nicely indeed it's not the current um style uh, the current kind of trend is to go as simple as possible very much the same as with an f18 because as well as being more simple it also reduces the amount of work uh moving parts uh taking the weight down and taking down the amount of things that could possibly let you down. But if it's the same shoot as on, on my boat, this uh, vintage, let's call it Marstrom Fellow, then what the fitting is on the front beam is it's basically like a square plate like that. So this would be the front beam like this. And on that square plate, it's got, it's kind of sectioned like that. And in each of these sections is a roller uh, like that. So one of those rollers will be for the tack line. So the line that pulls the tack of the spinnaker out. So if you imagine from there, the pole will come out in this direction. So the tack line will come out through that roller and then down and then off around a flat mounted block on the beam. This drawing is not particularly accurate, but just so you get the idea, through a flat mounted block to make it turn that 90 degree corner and then out to the side so that you could pull the tack out even while you're on the trapeze. Very nice. Uh, the other block would be where the line goes through for the retrieval. So that would go through there and then up and then through a block on, through a hole in the trampoline, through a block on the trampoline, and you'd pull that one um, to drop the spinnaker. So then how does the spinnaker actually attach let's see if i've got something here that i can use as a kind of just to give you the idea i'm sure that i have um all right i'm going to use this it's not so this if the end of your spinnaker pole is like this kind of uh where it's just the round tube uh with a big opening then basically that just slots onto that fitting like that. So the fitting would be like this and it just slots on there. And that is literally it. That is how it fits. Um, now, I've, I have seen other methods of bowsprit attachment. One is where the end of the spinnaker pole. So let's see if we can have a little illustration here. So if that's the end of the spinnaker pole, then there's like a spike that just sticks out of the end. And that is definitely the most simple attachment for the spinnaker pole, because then in your front beam. So if this is the front of the front beam. You just have to have if it hasn't got one already, 
a hole. Sorry, that is a hole that's been drilled in there. That spike goes in through the, the hole. And then with both of these, it's just the tension in the pole bridle wires, which hold the spinnaker pole in position. Now, the other method of attachment, which is quite common, and is um, what you'd have on the boat is, again, on the front beam, front beam like this, you'd have a fitting like a plate like this and then somehow there would be like some part that sticks out in front and then a bolt would go through that like this this is the bolt or a clevis pin with a ring in the end um and then on the other end of that would be the opposite end of that fitting which uh, it might just be as simple as if this is the pole, just having a hole drilled through the end, because once it's on there, it's not actually going to move. It's just going to be like sat up against the pole like that. Or it might actually have a fitting um, like um, this. What was the same fitting? The same fitting that the end of your boom might have, uh, for example. So those are the three most common um, spinnaker pole attachments that I have come across. So I hope that is of some sort of help. All right, we've got Stefan on board in Canada. Great to have you with us. We've got Mark and Janet um, coming in hot in Ohio, USA. RJ Fleet is with us on Lake Benton, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us. Clamour is here in Tallinn. I'm not entirely sure where Tallinn is. Clamour, if you can let us know where that is in the world, that would be very nice. Um, and then we've got Kevin on board in Germany. Hello, Kevin. Guten Tag. Uh, Jeffrey is with us uh, from Michigan. Unfortunately, his uh, Hobie 17 has been winterized this past week up this past weekend hurry up spring yeah i'm sure that's the feeling a lot of um the viewers especially in the northern hemisphere may be having right now i know right now the south africans are going to be rubbing their hands together as that season of sweet wind is upon them and i would dare say the same for the aussies and the guys in south america so um you know did you know that the speed stick is still going. It's got two months left to run. So if you are lucky enough to be able to get out on the water in some sweet wind, when well, why not take a GPS with you? Get on the speed stick if you're not on there already. Or if you are on there already, update your speed stick score. Of course, to do that, you are going to have to go a bit faster. There we are. All right, Leland Lee says the mast is back on my Hobie 16 and gets super hot to touch while stepping and dropping. Any ideas on paint to reduce the heat? No, it's um, for an aluminium mast that is black in colour. Um, it's not generally the vibe to paint your mast. I don't know um, if anybody is painting their mast because... The main problem with painting your mast is it's not going to take very long until you start your mast starts looking a little bit rubbish because the paint will start getting scratched, flaking off, and it won't look particularly glamorous. Yes, you could paint your mast uh, white, or personally, I'd quite like to paint a mast minging green. I think that would look pretty cool. Um, but it I think it's not going to take long until at, especially the lower section of the mast looks pretty rubbish. What I do, uh, because the mast here in the summer, um, if we drop a mast in the afternoon or put a mast up in the afternoon, then it can be so hot it is painful to touch. So uh, simply wearing some gloves uh, seems to be a lot more of a simple solution rather than having to paint it 
Um, yeah, or hosing it down before handling it. But um, you could try painting your mask with the carbon mask. It is uh, very popular to paint or put a coating on the mask to protect the carbon fiber from the UV. So um, it's not out of the question to paint it, just not a particularly normal thing to do. All right, we've got Declan on board in, I believe, Stockholm, Sweden. Great to have you with us, said Declan. We've got Scott dropping it in the slot. Um, you may have seen uh, Scott on a video on Joyrider TV, putting in the fastest sailing of the season here at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, where it did raise the question, if you are running two GPSs, should you always just pick whichever speed is faster or should you go with the GPS, which you use every time? I say just for the good of the game, of how fast are we going? You, if you're using the same GPS every time, stick with that one if you happen to have another one running and it is telling you um, a faster speed, uh, you should still go with the um, GPS that you use more frequently because as well as competing against the world, you are competing mostly against yourself. And uh, that guy, you know, wants to keep it consistent. All right, Hanny's with us. Hello, Hanny. Great to have you on board. This is the mug. Uh, makes drinks taste better. This mug is from Delft in Holland, which is famous for white with blue in the mug department. Um, Hanny's in Amsterdam. The videos about Mauritius give a very good impression of the sailing there. I've seen them all. Yes. So we're coming in hot from Mauritius. I'm not actually in Mauritius. I'm in Vasiliki, but uh, Mauritius is the hot destination for this winter. So if you haven't yet checked out Wild with Mauritius, do check out those videos or I will put a link in the video description afterwards uh, um, with a link so you can check out the Wild with Mauritius website. All right. Toot says multi-hole racing at Austin Yacht Club this weekend. Cool. I would be there with bells on. If you sail a multi-hole and you're in Texas, get down to Austin Yacht Club this weekend. Get involved. All right. Declan's done either some research or maybe he knows. Um, Tallinn is in Estonia. There we go. I didn't know that. Um, thanks for that, Declan. All right. Scott says, question. I had to move. Scott sells a 16, incidentally. I had to move the shrouds up from the third hole to the fifth hole from the bottom on the chain plate in order to push the mast forward enough to use the mast step link to take down the mast. Yes, that is pretty not. Well, it is definitely what I have found with the mast um, step adapter for putting the mast up and down on a 16 or a 14 with the shrouds in the position, um, it takes a lot of persuasion to get the hole in the um, mast base to line up with the hole in the mast, uh, the mast, what do you call it? I call it the mast erector um, security device. Yeah, so what I found works rather than moving the shrouds up is if when your jib is down, there's a load of slack in your rig anyway. What I do to get that mast connection kit engaged is with the rig tension off, I'll just lift the mast up a bit um, from the bottom and until it lines up with the holes. But perhaps it is necessary to change your shrouds, which is a bit of a pain. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Clamour uh, um, is here with the confirmation that Tallinn is the capital of Estonia tomorrow, flying home and sailing in Holland. Great stuff. Uh, Scott says, would you consider that normal um, back on the mast connection kit? Yes, I would consider it normal that it is not totally easy 
to get that hooked up for putting the mast up or down on your 16. All right, we've got Boating Blacksmith on board. Great to have you with us. We've got Roberto. Bonjour, no? Roberto, he's in Italy. All right, Declan says, winterizing my getaway on Sunday. Given the unusually warm weather, I have a birthday sailing weekend this weekend. I have yet, I have left the trampoline in place previously. Do you recommend de-rigging them? Yeah, well, firstly, happy birthday for this weekend, Declan. Hope you have a great sail. Um, but would I leave the trampoline on the boat over the winter? If the boat is staying outdoors, I would definitely take the trampoline off. And that is whether you're going to be putting a cover over the boat or not. Because as well as the elements getting to the trampoline from the top, uh, certain things can get to the trampoline from underneath as well. And your trampoline is going to end up being in better condition if you take it off the boat completely for the winter, unless you happen to have the boat stored indoors, if you're lucky enough to have that sort of space. Um, yeah, so if you are storing your boat for the winter, the more things that you can store indoors, the better. Um, so if you're able, like if you don't have masses of space, but you can take off the trampoline, take the rigging off the mast, um, take off all of the ropes so that all of that you've actually got being stored outdoors is the mast and the hulls, then, then, um, or the mast and the platform, then that is the best that you could possibly do for your boat. Unless, like I said, unless you are lucky enough to have enough space. All right. So boating blacksmith, blacksmith says, what are some of your quick tips for racing a Hobie 16? Got a race this weekend down here in Florida. OK, I'd say the main tip, if you're not so familiar with racing and you go racing this weekend or any time, is to give yourself loads and loads of time. So if it is possible, let's say that the racing starts tomorrow on Saturday. Um, if it is possible to get to the venue the day before, so that even if the racing starts in the afternoon on the Saturday, you've got the whole morning to get your boat sorted out, um, to get registered. Um, so let's look at how things, how long things might take. Um, so this is once you have found the venue where the event is going to be and perhaps you've parked your trailer with the boat on it. So um, prepare boat. Prepare, preparing the boat. Let's be really conservative and say that that could take one and a half hours. You know, um, if you're not so used to going to events, putting your boat, um, getting your boat off the trailer, putting the mast up, sails up, that kind of thing. So one and a half hours to prepare the boat. Um, register. If it's a busy event, that could take up to half an hour. So um, what else do you need to know? You need to um, read the sailing instructions. Um, so what would you call it? Um, do some background reading um, to know exactly what is going on. I would certainly invest half an hour in that because... If you don't know on the race course where you're going, then you're already losing because you don't know where you're going. So um, read the sailing instructions. If the event isn't such that you have sailing instru instructions, sailing instructions are basically like a printed couple of pages or at some events, even a small booklet, which 
a pretty standard from event to event. But if you're not so used to going to events, then you will want to read the whole thing. Perhaps the event has released the sailing instructions online beforehand so that you've had the chance to read the sailing instructions before you even get there. But the things that you will need to know most from the sailing instructions are what is the start sequence? What is the course? Including the finishing procedure um, and any special instructions. So anything special, which might be such as um, every boat has to display the event sponsor's logo, where you'd be given a sticker to put on your boat at registration. So things like that. So get all that done. This isn't in order either. So you might get to event um, on the Friday, let's say, and you might be able to catch registration on the Friday, get registered so that then that evening, usually when you register, that is when you'll be given a paper copy of the sailing instructions. So then on the Friday evening, perhaps over a few drinks, you can read all of this lot. So then the next morning, all you've got to do is prepare the boat um, options. And then once all that's done, you, if the racing is all going to be in the afternoon, allow time for lunch. Yeah. Allow some time for lunch and then uh, get change and launch. And if you don't event, um, arrive at the event in plenty of time, you can find that all of this lot takes you a lot longer lunch. Let's say if you're pretty quick and organized, change and launch. Um, if it's a busy event, there might be a queue of boats all trying to launch from the same place. So it can end up taking you some time. So what are we up to there? Two hours, three, hour, um, three hours at least to get ready um, for the event. Yeah. So get there early. That is my one nugget of information when going to a race. And then the second thing you really need to know is before, if possible, but certainly once you are out on the race course waiting for the start, know where the, well, firstly, know where the start line is, but then know where the marks are of the course. Um, so, again, know where you're going. This is going to be the biggest thing that you need to know. So this is what we're going to talk about here. This is the real fundamentals of preparation when arriving at an event. I hope that was extremely helpful. If so, uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, hit the like button if you're um, thinking any of this is quite helpful. That would be very helpful for me. So um, I help you, you help me. And, and then by helping me, by giving it a like, this also means more people will get to see this, which means more people will get this great help if they're going to an event this weekend, especially. All right. Declan says, can we have a handicap system for the speed stick? Can't seem to get past 18 knots. Yeah, I I don't know how that would work. This would this would take somebody probably a lot cleverer than me to sort out how we could put on a handicap system for the speed stick, because on paper, a boat like an F-18 is much quicker than a Hobie 16. But the 16, as we know, um, controversially, is um, quicker on, when going for max speed. Um, so the, the sort of handicap system um, is going to be tricky to in, um, to put in there, to instigate. Um, but what we can do on the speed stick is when it comes to the end of year results, we can separate the different types of boat um, and then have a winner for each fleet. How about that? I think that's the best that we can do. 
All right. Office Hands Dave says we need some Texans, Buckeyes, and Michiganders in Vasiliki next September to increase the American invasion. September the 17th to the 24th is the Ionian Race Speed Week. See you there. Great idea there, Dave. Yes, come out. Third week in September is the sweet spot, but come out the second week as well. If you're coming from the US to Greece, two weeks is definitely better than one. Um, oh, here's a racing tip from Dave. He says, listen to all the winners talking about racing. Ask a million questions if they've got time for that. OK, Declan says uh, you recently spoke to Chip from Whirlwind Sales. Any other anecdotes from one of Hobie's original sale designers? Yeah, but not so many that could be um, repeated um, on the Internet, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I really do wish that I'd videoed the whole of the conversation that we had because Chip from Whirlwind Sales, who is the one of the um, original guys from the Hobie Cat sail loft in the USA, um, he was there um, at a very interesting time and really um, just fell into the job of being the main guy at Hobie Cat's sail loft. Before that, he was um, making sails for North Sails and he'd gone into it from a windsurfing background where he'd been working um, a bit like what I do, doing um, seasons teaching windsurfing. So um, originally, I believe it was on the Columbia River Gorge, um, which was very famous for windsurfing and still is um, over in the USA. So um, I'll have to come back to you on that, Declan, when I ever think about uh, what we talked about. All right. Oh, so Dave's come up with a handicap system for the speed stick. Take your boat speed and add one third of your age. And then that Dave says that means he's up to 45 knots. Very good. All right, Declan says, I have a big boat and I sail it solo. Yeah. So sailing a big boat solo isn't necessary, isn't particularly with the amount of people on the boat that is normal. Okay, it looks like we may be coming to an end here with the internet, which I thought wasn't going to let us down today. Sorry, I just had a warning that the internet was unstable. Um, checking all of the readouts here in television studio one. Uh, Dave says I went wonky for a few seconds. All right. Hopefully we can continue because I still haven't been through our preloaded questions just yet. All right. So. Yes, yeah, Scott says. Oh, uh, firstly, Boating Blacksmith says, when is the end of the speed stick? The speed stick will end at the end of the year with the speed stick competition. It is starting on January the 1st, ending on December 31st. So still plenty of time to get involved there. Uh, Scott says he got his sales from Chip at Whirlwind and they are sweet. Oh, yes. All right. Declan says, totally love to join that event. In fact, we need a Joyrider TV event week to celebrate Joe's last season. Umber blowout. Swedish accent from Frozen. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I'll um, I'll see what we can do. Perhaps in June would be a good time to do something here um, for a Joyrider TV special week here at Wildwind Sailing Holidays. All right. Yeah. So Toot says he's got a set of R plus sales from Whirlwind on the Hobie 17 and are great. Yeah. In fact, Chip was saying um, that there was quite a lot of chat that he'd had with the Hobie 17 class association in the USA, um, where at first there was some resistance to letting him produce the sales for the class legal sales for Hobie 17s because the original. Hobie 17 sails um, aren't particularly durable and the cut of the sails aren't quite so good. 
and Chip actually redesigned Hobie 17 sails to, um, to make them as both durable and performance oriented as possible. And he came up with sails which were so good that everybody in the class wanted them, which made the Hobie 17 class association have to kind of force the class association to have to say, yes, these are now the accepted sales for the Hobie 17 class association in the USA, which I believe is most of the Hobie 17 fleet globally. So great stuff there. Um, Declan says Studio One is still live. Great stuff. So I think we're about to jump in to our preloaded questions. And before we do that at 35, 36 minutes, just going to take a short commercial break. Mm. As part of this short commercial break, let me tell you about channel memberships. Oh, what's this? I hear you cry. Yeah. So I've just recently launched on my YouTube um, channel is um, what is called channel memberships. You'll see it at the bottom of every video. It'll say something along the lines of join channel or become a member or membership, something like that. And uh, one of the big perks that I've put as becoming a, a member of what I'm calling Joyrider SC, Joyrider Sailing Club on YouTube, is as soon as I have uploaded a video, you'll have access to that video immediately, which means you don't have to wait for the regular broadcast time, let's call it, of half past five in Greece. Um, so, for example, there is a hot video which is coming tomorrow afternoon at the usual time. But if you joined um, Joyrider Sailing Club channel membership, then you'd be able to access that immediately. As well as that, you actually get some custom emojis to use in any of the live chat or the comments, anything like that, uh, just for a small price every month. And it means you can support Joyrider TV without having to leave the platform of YouTube um, without having to go to Patreon and setting up an account or anything there, you can actually do it with your YouTube user ID as it is. So there you go. That is some advertising because the winter is long and um, have a family to support and stuff like that. Start. Uh, okay, let's turn the elevator music off and get on with some preloaded questions. Here we go. Okay, so the first one is from uh cadence and dj car who says concerning position in single-handed sailing a friend of mine told me it's important to be as far forwards as possible in the front of the catamaran when sailing single-handed what are your thoughts on this is there any truth in this okay so i would say firstly and generally not so much. All right. If we draw a standard catamaran, um, this question was in response to a video. You may think that's not a catamaran. That is actually a rectangle. But if we put in a dagger board there and a rudder there and a mast there. OK, so what we need to think of when we're sailing a catamaran, whatever type of catamaran it is, is that the optimal position for the boat to be in is with the boat very flat in a forwards and backwards. This is most of the time. So it wants to be quite flat with the water. If. The bow is pointing upwards. Obviously, this is an exaggeration. Then we're going to be dragging the back part of the boat, which is generally um, a wider section of the hull, which causes a lot of drag. It's also going to drag the rudder system through the water. So if you're ever sailing and you hear a load of noise coming from the back of the boat, um, especially in lighter winds, then it may be 
that your weight is too far back. A lot of uh, sailors, especially recreational sailors, are sailing with their weight too far back on the boat generally. So this is whether you're single handed or sailing with a crew. We're looking to get the boat pretty much level with the horizon. Another way of checking to see if your weight is trimmed too far back is if you sail a boat which has some sort of corner at the front. So this boat has definitely got a corner here. If the corner is out of the water and the wind is light, this generally means your weight is too far back and you should move forwards. One big reason why people generally sail the boat sat too far back is because it is very comfortable to be further back on the boat. You've got better control over the steering. You're closer to the main sheet. Um, you've got more space, especially if there's more than one of you on the boat. But it is going to mean your boat is not going to be sailing as fast as optimal. And then if we're sailing with too much weight in the front. Now, in certain situations, it does work to get really far forwards. Like, for example, in very light winds, sailing downwind, only downwind, but in very light winds, sailing downwind, what this does is it actually gives you effectively, I think someone could put it in the comments if you think otherwise, but this could give you a longer waterline length. If we take the waterline as starting at the bow and ending at the rudder, it could give you a longer waterline length, which does give you a higher top speed. And not only that, but if you're sailing a boat which has um, mast rake on it, which all boats would have, is it will bring the mast more upright, which effectively will present more sail area to the wind, making the boat more powerful. So that would be for getting the mast more upright in the light winds just for downwind sailing only. That's the only time when we really want to get the boat bows down like that, which means, oh, why do we not want to have the boat bows down? It's because when we're sailing along, we've got um, the foils, the dagger boards and the rudders. And what we're looking to do is get lift from the foils. So if we go really far forwards, you can see our rudders are almost out of the water which means we're not getting as much lift from the rudders, which is why keeping the boat completely flat is optimal. So if you're sailing single handed, what is that going to mean? Um, it's going to mean like, let's draw on in blue, if we were sailing with two people. So if we were sailing with two people, you might be kind of sat here on the boat but if you're single-handed then what that's going to mean is you're going to need to be slightly further forwards in fact you're going to want to be a little bit over halfway where the two people were if you were single if you were sailing with two so yes you will have to be slightly further forwards if you're single-handed but what we're looking at is keeping the boat flat and level. There we go. Hope that helps. Hope that is a good answer. Okay, back to the live chat. Um, we've got Jamie or Jem Bravo or Jamie Bravo, um, who says, Good morning. Any tips on beach landings through the surf with a Hobie 16? We'll be having camping gear and the wind will likely be side shore. Okay. Yeah, it's not something we do a lot of here because um, of our stony beach where we don't we try not to do any, to be honest. But um, if it is a sandy beach, then we are definitely winning. Um, so if this is our beach here. 
if it's a sandy beach and we've got breaking waves coming into the beach, of course, there are different grades of breaking waves. There is sometimes, um, it depends, the, the nature of the wave depends on the nature of the seabed. So if this is the seabed here, if the seabed shelves suddenly like this, then what will happen is we'll get what is called shore dump because out here we'll just have a rolling swell. But what happens is when the wave goes into water, which is equal to the depth, the height of the wave equal to the depth of the water, that is when the wave will break. So when the wave gets here, then we'll get a shore dump. This is a really dangerous position to be in um, on any sort of vessel, whether it's a sailing boat, um, surfboard, wind surfboard, kayak, um, I don't know, anything else, um, canoe, anything. So if we're coming in and the nature, when we launch, we should know what sort of waves we're going into. So this is the worst sort of waves. So if we're coming in with these sort of waves, where we want to be positioning our boat is on, this is not to scale, hopefully not to scale. We want to have our boat on the back of the wave as it comes in so that as that wave pushes water up the beach, it's going to kind of, gent as long as we stay on the back of it, it's going to kind of lower our boat onto the beach, um, which is definitely the desirable spot. Whereas being in here, what can happen if it's particularly big is we can get what's called sucked up the face and then dumped upside down, which will dump all of your camping gear. It will break your mast. It will upset your sailing partner. Um, the dog will get very wet and nobody will be having a good time. So coming on the back of the wave, that is much, 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 much safer, better and better in most situations. Now, in other places. It might not be. Well, that is quite an extreme example. So if the seabed is much more gradually sloping. then the waves are going to break much further out. And then when we when those waves get to the beach, they're going to end up just being white water or foamies, as I believe they call them in uh, certain countries um, going onto the beach, which means it isn't so bad. Again, here, where the wave's breaking, unless it's only a small wave, you don't want to be in front of the wave unless you do want to surf that wave, uh, like in the film um, Sharing the Wind. If you haven't seen Sharing the Wind, you have to check it out. But most of the time, safer is to come in on the back of the wave. That wave will break. And then by the time you get here, you might just get pushed along a little bit by a foamy, which is the broken wave ending up on the beach. Very nice. Now, the last thing is, whichever type of waves you're encountering, I'd say if it's a shore dump and it's not a sandy beach, then you should really be looking for an alternative launching spot. But um, if it's just small waves and it's not a sandy beach, so you don't want to be running your boat up to, up the beach, then what I would, two things you can do, um, and let's go for a top down view rather than the side view. If this is the beach, this is the wind, um, is you can either come in like this. Oh, you said the wind side shore, didn't you? So this should be reasonably easy. Uh, come in like this, turn the boat head to wind, jump off and quickly get what you need to get the boat onto the beach. In fact, if it's sideshore, 
that would be the only thing that you could do. Uh, one thing, yeah, that would be the way. So there we go. I think that is about all I'm going to say about that for now. Pardon, for now. All right, Clamour. How are you doing, Clamour? Great to have you on board in the live chat. Um, I remember great instructions on trim from Ollie Smith uh, this summer at Wildwind. Yes, Ollie is one of our top catamaran instructors who will be returning next season. We've just had that news in. All right. So um, we've got Max on board at Simsi, Germany. Still no wind at Lake Simsi. Hello there, Joe and the Cat Sailor community. Great to have you with us, Max. All right. So back to the uh, preloaded questions. Uh, this one's from Logan, who says, what is the fastest way to head downwind on a Hobie 16? All right. This is actually a little bit up for discussion. We're talking about VMG. But the, the first one, let's start off with light winds. And like I was saying just um, a few minutes ago with the crew position and the trim of the boat, in light winds, you can sail your 16 very deep indeed. So if over here we have what our course might be. So a very, our traditional catamaran sailor, downwind point of sail. And we talk about apparent wind when we're sailing downwind. And the apparent wind is the combination of the true wind, which is this big blue fella, and the induced wind. The wind that we create by going forwards. And then our apparent wind is the combination of these two winds. So what we end up having for our traditional catamaran sailors downwind point of sail is that apparent wind coming straight across the boat with our telltales. We should always have wind indicators on the front of the boat. These bad boys going at 90 degrees. That's perpendicular to the boat. Then the fastest way downwind in this very normal situation. So this is the normal way. Is Every time we get a gust of wind, so let's just draw on the apparent wind here. When we get a gust of wind, our the boat will go faster, which means we'll get more induced wind. As um, in proportion to the gust, the boat speed will always go faster than the gust. So. The induced wind, if we hold our course totally straight, will come more from in front in the gust. Which means we know that we want to keep our apparent wind on 90 degrees. So whenever there's a gust, we want to turn downwind more. So we do that by pulling the rudders towards us and turning downwind, keeping that apparent wind on 90 degrees. In the same way, if the wind goes a bit lighter, then our induced wind will fall down a little bit, we'll get less induced wind, and our apparent wind will actually start coming more from behind. So these wind indicators on the front will start blowing away from the boat forwards, which means we then need to turn the boat back up towards the wind. Whenever we're steering downwind, we're keeping our movements with the rudders very small and very smooth. Very important. If you make big movements with the rudders, then it really is going to be like putting the brakes on the boat. The boat is going to slow down and we're not going to be getting downwind as quickly. Um, so what we want to do in the gusts, or lulls where the wind is lighter is respond as soon as it's happening. So we're not going to go into the gust, sail five boat lengths with the apparent wind in the wrong spot and then bear away or head up. What we want to do is as soon as we go into the gust, we're going to react to it immediately, but 
only making a subtle movement with our rudders. That is the fastest and most efficient way to sail downwind. Now, one difference is in light winds, we're, this is in fact always going to be the way with our steering when we're sailing downwind. In the gusts, we sail more down. When the, in a lull, we're going to sail more up just to keep that apparent wind on exactly the same angle. This is also the same for if you're flying a spinnaker. In fact, it's even more important if you're flying a spinnaker because it's our steering, which is our power control downwind with the spinnaker up. Very important stuff. So um, one time when we can sail with the apparent wind actually further forwards, so deeper downwind, there's our bridle wires. So actually with our apparent wind, slightly forwards is on um, many types of boat. Like I said before, if we get, I'll draw a Hobie 16 because this kind of works the best with a 16. So there's that. There's the trampoline. Because a 16 especially carries so much mast rake, when you get really far forwards, like I said before, it means that the mast, this is a peculiar shaped mast, the mast actually ends up more upright. So if here's the water. So we're really trimming the boat down by getting the mast that much upright it means you can carry more speed deeper downwind, which is definitely a great way of going downhill there. And then there's a very good place to sit on the boat for going downwind with a 16 getting forwards. And that would be um, either there like that, or better still, if it's really light winds, and reaching back for the helm anyway, to steer the boat. And look, he's, his hair is blowing in the wind there. He's going so fast on that point of sail. So get really far forwards, only in really light winds. Very important tip there. All right, so Declan says I need to jump out. All right, see you later, Declan. Have a great birthday and um, enjoyed the, spe the spooky Irish festival. I didn't know. That Halloween was Irish. Hmm. I thought it was American. Uh, anyway, answers on a postcard. All right, on to the next preloaded question. And this one is from Todd. And he says, how do you prevent losing the boat if you get knocked off the boat or thrown off the boat or slip and lose your balance? Yes, this is something we have done much research on. And yes, it is a great concern, especially if you're sailing in open water single handed, because you definitely don't want to be falling overboard and the boat sailing off away from you. Because it's uh, from the research that I did, it actually turns out that in the lighter winds, this is when it's most dangerous because in light winds, if you fall off the boat and you're not holding on, um, then the um, the boat is just going to keep sailing off uh, because there's not enough power in the rig to make the boat head up into the wind and stop. So it's just going to keep going indefinitely. So if you're sailing out to sea, yeah. This could be trouble, which is why even in light wind, the most important thing to be holding on to on the boat is the main sheet. Never let go of the main sheet. Make sure you've always got the main sheet in your hand. So if for any reason you fall overboard, you slip, go overboard, you um, anything happens, you've got the main sheet in your hand and... Uh, with the main sheet in your hand, 
you know that if you fall in the water, just hold on tight to that main sheet. That is your lifeline. What's going to happen is as the main sheet comes tight, it's going to sheet the main sail in. The boat is going to head up into the wind. And either if it's windier, it's going to capsize. If it's not so windy, the boat is just going to go head to wind and stop. And then you can pull yourself back to the boat with the main sheet like that. There is some talk uh, that we've had in the past about having a safety line like you might have on a keel boat or a yacht. You actually clip onto yourself. Um, and I would say if you're sailing open sea single handed and you're going to be sailing on one tack for a long period, it's not actually something I've tried. But I would say it is worth considering doing um, if you're not. Um, what's the word? Um, if you're not sure that you're going to be able to keep your mind on keeping your hand on the main sheet. There we go. All right. So that's all we've got time for today. I would say before you go, please hit the like button. Um, if you've got any questions for next week's Q&A, uh, put them in the comments below. Thanks very much. Do check out um, channel memberships. It's new and I want to know how it's working out. If people who have subscribed, if they're thinking, yes, this is a great way of supporting Joyrider TV. Another great way of supporting the channel is to order some merch, uh, T-shirts, hoodies, hats and stuff. Um, I believe there's a big holiday coming up, especially in the USA. Um, if you want to get somebody a custom T-shirt, hoodie or anything else, get in touch. Send me an email. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone else. Thanks, Todd. Thanks to everybody for their questions or everybody for tuning in. And I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thank you very much. Thanks, Toot.